Weird. I don't know why I brought up the uh, the image of a map right away. What is up, everybody? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number ninety nine. That was a, a map from the Ginger Miss Run Hunt, where someone actually spelled Ginger Miss out uh, on the street. So that that's funny that that popped up first. Uh, happy holidays. The holidays are now done. Uh, it is the new year. This is the first episode of twenty sixteen. Very excited about that. And uh, my guest tonight is a seasoned ultra runner, race director, an all around badass dude. And I can't wait to pick his brain tonight about a lot of what happened in 2015 and a lot about what's happening in 2016. Very excited about tonight's show. And it is episode number 99. We are one week away from episode 100, and we're gonna have to we're gonna have to go big. I think that's inevitable. Uh, but tonight's guest is Mike Foot. Uh, I might call him Footy throughout the show just because that's everyone tells me to call him Footy, and he, he even said, "Yeah, call me Footy, whatever you want." Uh, but sit back, relax, grab whatever beverage you guys want because Ginger Runner Live begins now. <laughs> Ginger Runner. Yes, 99 episodes. 99. I cannot believe it. 99 episodes. Ginger Runner Live started uh, two years ago uh, just as a, a bit of an idea to, to kind of get the community talking on a regular basis with um, elite athletes uh, as well as regular everyday athletes, but really telling stories and basically uh, bringing the trail and ultra running community together with uh, elite athletes and asking questions pretty much right there on the spot. That was kind of the idea years ago and it has evolved into so much more. The community has really, really grown. The podcast version is also downloaded incredibly frequently. It's kind of overwhelming and there'll be a lot of updating to that this year. Um, my first guest of the new year, my last guest before we hit episode 100 next week, uh, he is coming to us from Montana. It is Mike Foot, aka Footy, North Face athlete, uh, a badass. A lot went on in 2015. Welcome him to the show. What is up, Footy? How you doing, man? Ethan, um, I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. Um, thanks for having me on. I just curious if I'm not a big enough of a deal to be on the 100th episode. I mean, I saw that we're 99 in, and um, I was like, how can we? How can we make Mike feel really bad? We'll put him on the show right before the hundred. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm glad I'm the first uh, guest for 2016. Thank you. <laughs> the first official guest of 2016. That in itself is a huge honor, dude. How are you? How were your holidays? My holidays were good. Yeah, I spent them in rainy, cold Ohio, uh, which is where I'm from. So I got to see my my mom, my sister, and yeah, it was actually a really good trip. Just extremely mellow. Uh, got me excited to be back in Montana for some skiing when I got home. And yeah, how about you? Same. Well, not Ohio, but uh, it was nice and relaxing. Um, got to enjoy the outdoors a lot and got to see a ton of family, which is really good back in the Northwest. Um, for you, uh, talking to a lot of elites and, and their off season, was the holiday break for you some sort of off season or were you regularly training or, or kind of changing it up and doing skiing more? Yeah, so that's a good question, actually. Historically, I take December off for the last five years. I have done the TNF 50 in San Francisco in early December and then don't really do much until the beginning of the next year. However, this year after the Crown Traverse in October, which ended in early October, I've really been not doing much for like six or eight weeks. And then now for the last month, I've been getting back into training for ski mountaineer racing, which I'll be um, taking a big crack at this winter. So definitely changing nice. it up, but I think it'll be good for both my mind and also hopefully my running next year as well. So a lot of talk going on in the chat room about Montana. Uh, people are giving you shout outs and people talk about um, needing to get to Montana. What is it like living in Montana compared to other states that maybe you've lived in as far as training is concerned? You've got big mountains, you've got altitude. Uh, are there benefits to, uh, to Montana? Yeah, geez, of course, I think so. Um, well, it's definitely better for training for mountain running than Ohio, which is the other state I've lived in. Uh, I have lived in Colorado as well, which is another beautiful, great area. Uh, so I live in Missoula, which has an incredible amount of accessibility. I think that'd be the biggest thing. I mean, there's so many trails from my front door that I can just hit up um, year round with, I can go for steep trails, I can go for less steep, I can go uh, technical, non-technical. I just feel like there's everything I need here to train for whatever goals I have in a given year. Right. And that's really important to me. And then also it's just 
uh, it just has a little bit more sense of wildness to it. The open spaces are a little bit larger. Uh, there's more wildlife, um, things like that, which don't necessarily lend to training any better, but definitely are just part of the lifestyle that I really enjoy. Is there a pretty decent trail running community up there? Yeah, yeah, Missoula's great, uh, and it's only growing. It's incredible. Uh, I mean, I'm a race director here in town, so we're putting on trail races all the time. They're just continually growing. Uh, lots of fun community events and really, really strong uh, male and female trail runners who you know, aren't sponsored or anything but can go crush it in any local or regional race. So it's, really, it's a really cool community. And uh, not able to join us tonight, but uh, I'm guessing a partner in crime, a good buddy of yours, Mike Wolf, um, who also did the Crown Traverse, also a Montana, Montana in, Montana in, Montana, Montana. Montana. <laughs> uh, do you guys train a lot together? Do you guys end up doing a lot of uh, a lot of the same stuff together? Yeah, I mean, we we have the exact a very similar approach to training and racing and the goals that we have. Uh, you know, we both also do our own thing quite a bit. You know, we'll we'll go six weeks without seeing each other and then we'll train a bunch together because we'll just have the opportunity to. Um, we're definitely good friends and we live a mile, mile and a half from one another. So we definitely- Oh, nice. Bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was laid up, before that we did this big run this last fall, he was laid up with an ankle injury for almost a year between being injured, surgery and recovery. So. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time for him. And just in this last fall and winter, we've definitely been getting out a lot more together. Uh, what are you partaking in beverage to, be, beverage wise tonight? I saw that you were. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have the Beer de Noel, which is a winter strong ale from Big Sky Brewing Company. It, uh, it's 10.1% alcohol. <laughs> so I'm not, <laughs> which goes to show how nervous I am to be on your show. I needed this. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'll finish the whole thing, but it's uh, it's a nice seasonal from Big Sky. <laughs> How about you? Uh, I was trying to find where it was brewed, um, but this is Top Cutter IPA from Bale Breaker, uh, nice. which is uh, brewed in the Yakima Valley. And I had one when I first, basically on the first day of this trip, uh, I had one of these and it was like, this is good. So I've just been taking it <laughs> all week. Um, I want to talk a bit about kind of how you got into ultra running, ultra racing, uh, and kind of your evolution because you you fairly quickly went from um, just kind of having fun or getting lost on the trails, it sounds like, during races uh, to an elite um, sponsored athlete with the North Face. Kind of how, how did you get started? What was your draw to the trails and, and kind of the evolution? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned before, I grew up in Ohio throughout my entire life uh, or my entire childhood. I literally never saw a mountain until I was 18 years old. Um, moved out wow. west, yeah. Um, moved out west to Montana to finish my undergrad in 2004. And again, just living in Missoula, I was really inspired to kind of take breaks in between classes and head out on the trails and explore. And one thing led to another and being, being in Western Montana, there's just so many opportunities for big adventures. I uh, started spending summers up in Glacier National Park and doing really big like mountain objectives where I'd have yeah. to run further and further into um, big peaks in the backcountry and uh, started signing up for races. In 2009, I ran my first ultra marathon, which was a 50K in Bozeman, which had 11,000 feet of vert in it. So it was like, <laughs> I, I, never, I never learned, like in my, my first 100 miler was the Wasatch 100. My second 100 miler was Hard Rock. So I never learned about races that weren't really, really slow and really, really steep, um, which was probably a good thing because I ended up loving that style of racing where it's kind of yeah. more about strength and durability and less about speed. Um, that's kind of always been what's inspired me, but also where I think my strengths are. Uh, and yeah, in the last, so I, amidst all this, met Mike Wolf and, uh, you know, was really uh, kind of nervous to meet him because at that time he was already the 100 mile USATF uh, trail national champion and right. uh, a fellow Montanan, but I was like, uh, just seeing his approach to running and uh, you know, what he was doing really inspired me to kind of push what I was able to do a little bit more. And sure. I ran the 2010 Hard Rock 100 and he actually was down there pacing a mutual friend of ours whom dropped out. And then Mike jumped in last minute and paced me to a third place finish. And that was kind of the beginning of 
oh, okay, I need to take this seriously. So um, yeah, that was definitely the point where I, I wanted to be on something like a, the North Face team where I felt like I was a part of something and um, try and get support to go to bigger races and um, commit a little bit further. Do you find yourself wanting to fill your your calendar year up with races or I noticed uh, last year you have a number of incredible results but you you know you're not racing once a month and, and trying to travel the globe and do all this sort of thing do you try to divvy up your time between racing and adventuring or do you tend to go one way more than the other yeah Whew. man that's like the the like ever-evolving question I think is how you want to approach it in your your relationship with racing at any given time or any given year. Last year was probably the, I raced, I think only like four or five running races, only a couple, you know, bigger ones, the Hard Rock, Squamish 50, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and last year was just a year where I knew that I wasn't going to race every month. I have done that a few years ago. I was, you know, training for UTMF, which was in April, a hundred miler in April. And so in January and February, I was putting in huge miles in the middle of winter in Western Montana, just running on like the few trails oh. I knew that I could get um, big vert and on without just post holing the entire time, you know, right close to town. And so it, it ebbs and it flows. And for me, I'm definitely, I identify uh, as a runner, obviously, but I also identify as somebody who's really excited about big mountain objectives and, um, you know, I think in my evolution as a, an athlete, I'm definitely really excited about competition and I want to make sure I choose those competitions wisely though, because I see so much burnout happening mm -hmm. that I personally want to be like excited and eager and ex inspired to compete. And some people have a higher threshold than I do. There's no doubt about it and can stay healthy and compete well, but I definitely need like more mixture in my life. Um, whether it's skiing and ski, ski mountaineer racing, I'm giving a shot at this winter or. Which is awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. And it's such a natural progression for, again, living here in Montana, just um, cold and wintry here, uh, but also just fun adventures. I think uh, I just glean a lot of inspiration out of those things too. So, yeah. Nice. We have a lot of really great questions coming to us from a live audience. If you are watching live, jump into the chat room. You can toss a question uh, at footy that way. Kim is also in the chat room. She's sitting across from me. Uh, she will kind of go through all the questions and she'll be feeding those to me as well as on Twitter. We have a question here on Twitter from Tim Jelraus. Let's pull this up here. Uh, the question reads, Mike, tell us about your coolest <laughs> wildlife encounters while running in Montana. Grizz, wolverines, wolves. What do you got? I'm sure you have plenty. Yeah, I've seen them all. Um, I've had a few Wolverine encounters, which has been really cool because they're like the most elusive, badass kind of wildlife in Montana. Um, I, I have been uh, bluff charged by a grizzly bear sow, so like mama grizzly bear uh, in the foothills of a mountain range a few years ago, which, uh, you know, was an eye opening experience. I was on like a ranch road near some mountains not even up in the mountains where i often carry my bear spray but uh yeah she she got within like a foot of me and roared in my face and wow. uh, yeah i was i was pretty gun shy for uh a few months after that but um i've also had a black bear break in them i used to live in a year up in the hills outside of town here and i had a black bear that i was awesome. dealing with for a few weeks that broke into my house and just terrorized me for a couple of weeks. Um, so I've definitely had a lot of fun. I've been treated by a moose. I mean, I've seen, I've had, I've had a million benign encounters with wildlife, but right. I've also had a handful of uh, kind of more exciting uh, interactions as well. So living in a yurt, that's interesting. So do you prefer the yurt life or, or the more in town life? Not that Missoula is like a huge town, but uh, which do you prefer? Yeah, you know, your life's pretty good. Um, I did just buy a house with my girlfriend, which is the house I'm in right now, uh, this June. So, and she's she's a big supporter of the year. But I think between the two of us and our hundred pound German Shepherd, uh, we we needed a little bit more space. And yeah, <laughs> the house isn't even that big, but it's definitely a step up from like a four hundred square foot year. Um, but it's still standing, and uh, yeah, I'll be spending some time up there. We'll be spending some time up there throughout the winter, but. 
uh, yeah, I lived in it for four years and there's parts of it I miss and parts of it I definitely don't miss. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, yeah. I remember there was some, I think it was an online discussion. I think Brian Powell brought it up at one point because he was interested in, in doing the yurt life for a bit, but uh, I feel like the discussion goes around the community at least once a year. So when someone brings up the idea of living in a yurt and yeah, yeah. everyone always mentions you because <laughs> you've lived it, you've done oh, yeah. it. It's, all, it's cold when it's cold, it's hot when it's hot, but when you can get the temperature just right and it's cozy in there, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> uh, some great questions coming from the live chat room from Kimo Sabi 75 He has a couple in here. Uh, footy, what makes you guys, footy, what makes you guys good training buddies referring to uh, you and Mike Wolf? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think anybody who will get out the door with you is a good training buddy because um, they're going to hold you accountable. I think uh, I mentioned it earlier. Mike and I uh, have a very similar approach to like the sport of mountain running and the things mm -hmm. that inspire us. So we're often training for similar goals and the way that we like to achieve those goals. Uh, we also have a similar kind of strategy and just like um, where we like to go, what we like to do, our approach to training. So. I think that is probably what makes Mike a really good training partner, for sure. We have another one in here. Oh, I just lost. There we go. Uh, Kimo Selby also continued to ask, are you a full-time pro athlete now? What are your career plans for running and trail running? Um, I am, yeah. So I work full-time as a, uh, an employee at a running store here in Missoula called The Runner's Edge. And I am essentially in the last three or four years – so they're a great just single store, you know, single door, uh, family owned business. I mean, I, I feel like I'm part of the family there. Uh, we work together to make a lot of great things happen in the running community. And it's been my job the last few years to take over and build the events side of the running store, mm -hmm. uh, which involves things like the rut mountain runs. But also, I mean, just a few days ago, I put on a 500 person New Year's Day run on, it was a 5K road run. So, I mean, we kind of do everything and we, cater to all parts of the running community here in Missoula. I mean, obviously my passions lie in trail running, but yeah, that's a full-time job. And, and yeah, I guess that answers it. I definitely am not a full-time trail running athlete. Got it. Uh, in 2015, you had some pretty uh, stellar results. Um, Hard Rock 100 being one of them uh, with a big old second place finish at Hard Rock, which is notoriously uh, I've had multiple guests on the on the show that have finished the race and talk about just how brutal it is, whether the weather uh, comes in and, and does its nasty dance on the runners or the terrain itself, the the epicness of it. You have a draw to Hard Rock. Um, what is that draw? What keeps you coming back? What's the community like? And, and what was this year's race like for you? Yeah. Yeah. Hard Rock's a special race. I mean, not only the course, but yeah, the community of people. I mean, everybody who goes there has so much respect for the sport of trail running and mountain running, respect for the, the that course, that race, but um, just also each other. I mean, it definitely feels like family. I think that was, that's probably the main thing that not only brings me to hard rock, but keeps me in the sport of ultra running. I just think it's so great. All like so many of my good friends now are people I met along the way running. And um, yeah, it's just, I think uh, hard rock really embodies that. Uh, but the course is incredible. I mean, there's no more aesthetic, challenging, slow, steep 100 miler in, in the United States and maybe the world. I just don't know of all of the other ones out there, but uh, it's it just feels very wild. It's like you mentioned, I mean, I got uh, stormed on four different times in the race where you you're in survival mode, you know, just trying to find cover up high and then it blows by and it's beautiful and sunny again. And then you just go through those cycles and it just kind of wears you down. Unlike any other race I've ever done, which wow. is always hard in the moment, but is the reason you want to do it. Cause you want to get to that point where you're, you know, learn, learning a bit about yourself, I guess. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's definitely why hard rock pulls me back. I put in again for 2016, but um, I did not get in. So. Yeah, <laughs> they don't have any sort of like auto. The top ten guys or top ten women automatically Just the winner. Yeah, Just the winner. Yeah. Which, uh, <laughs> well, you know, hopefully you'll be able to get back because it sounds like it's 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 quite a personal race for you as well as just a incredible challenge overall. Um, I'm just 
I just know having looking at your results from this last year, running the the Yakima Skyline 50K uh, Rain Shadow Race, which is just incredible, but also very very tough. Hard Rock 100, and then the Squamish 50, uh, a Gary Robbins race, which I've, I have a very close personal connection to as well. It seemed like you were setting yourself up for something later in the year, the Crown Traverse. Was that something that you had intended to run all year? Was it a last minute, like, hey, let's go do this? <laughs> um, no, we, so it's something that's been uh, kind of evolving into an idea for years now. Uh, but we had myself, Mike Wolf, and then also a friend of ours who's a photographer, Stephen Nam, the three of us set out to do it this fall, and we had been planning it for a full year. So it very much was going to be a, an abbreviated running season for me, uh, and then just leading into A, race directing the rut, and then a week later taking off for this huge crown traverse. So yeah, that was the plan all along, for sure. It's a huge undertaking. Can you kind of uh, just describe the stats associated with the crown traverse? Yeah, um, so the Crown Traverse was a run that myself, Mike Wolf, uh, and partially this friend of ours, Stephen Nam, uh, did this fall starting from our front doorsteps in Missoula, Montana, and running all the way to Banff, Canada. Uh, it was a 600 mile high mountain traverse, mostly off trail, that took us 23 days. I think we covered, I'm, not, I'm already forgetting the all of the stats. I mean, I, I think it might have been close to a couple hundred thousand. Uh, feet of vertical gain and 13 or 14 mountain ranges along the way. Uh, essentially, we were going from south to north across the entire eco region known as the crown of the continent, which is one of the most intact uh, uh, contiguous ecosystems in the United States. It's insane. Uh, <laughs> 600, it, it, it. That just to put it lightly, so Hard Rock Run Hundred is is notorious for being just a, a brutally tough mountain race in the San Juans of Colorado. Uh, the Crown Traverse. Uh, I think you were the first humans to attempt the entire six hundred mile stretch. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think <laughs> people have like probably hiked it. I mean, I'm not. The route that we did was very unique because we like chose to be off trail the majority of the time, so we were often looking for ridge lines to um, follow along from south to north. And so the way that we moved through definitely was uh, is unique. I don't think anybody's ever done their actual route that we chose. Was it a, this is what I was most curious about, is if it was some sort of mixture of hiking, running, climbing, snow uh, travel. I mean, what was the mix for you guys? What was the intended mix? Like, did you anticipate doing a majority running hiking? Was there any sort of expectation versus reality? Oh gosh, yeah, there's so much of that. I do think that we kind of romanticized early on staring at maps, like, oh, we can do this high mountain traverse and we'll just follow ridge lines and it'll be beautiful. And in the back of my mind, I kept thinking like, ah, oh, yeah, that sounds nice, but I'm sure that won't happen. And I will say that one expectation that actually was reached was that the majority of the time we were able to stay up high following ridge lines, following game trails of mountain goats, grizzly bears, um, elk, uh, you know, wolverines, all the above. It was a really neat thing to um, con like very continuously day in and day out for weeks um, travel in that style. Um, definitely there was things that didn't work out. I mean, we never knew how much weather we would have, if there would be snow, things like that, but how slow right. we move. I mean, it definitely was about efficient mountain travel more than it was about running. So we put ourselves in terrain that wasn't necessarily runnable a lot. And we oftentimes, or half, at least half the time we had overnight Bibby gear with us, which, you know, no matter how lightweight it is, which we had great lightweight stuff was still heavy, especially with carrying food and water. So just. I think one thing that was a little, that beat us up a little bit was how long the days were due to how slow the train was and the weight we were carrying. And mm. it, just, it just wore us down. I mean, it really, really <laughs> wore us down when we'd have a an 11 or 12 hour day that would involve lots and lots of like using our hands, scrambling and, and carrying a 25 pound pack, 30 pound pack, and we'd cover 18 miles and we would just be utterly exhausted at the end of the day. And then the next day we'd have trails and we'd go for 40 miles. Like it was just this very unique um, blend of skill sets that we had to kind of pull from throughout the whole trip, which made it the most like a very unique experience for me. Yeah. Did you allow yourselves daily audibles in the sense where you knew tomorrow you'd have to do some, 
you know, 15,000 feet of gain or something over rock scrambles and stuff like that. Would you call an audible if for some reason you guys weren't feeling it and, you know, do a roundabout route or was it, this is the route we chose. Uh, people know that we are on this route. This is what we have to do. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think, uh, it just depended on the day. Uh, we had a one man support crew, uh, who had a van that was following us along and, uh, there were times where, we were, <clears throat> excuse me, where we could communicate with him and have him go further or perhaps shorter to meet us from a different trailhead if we had to. Mm. Um, but those days were kind of rare. I mean, more than anything, especially if we were out on our own, we had certain objectives. But on, on the macro scale, we kind of knew these points we wanted to hit, right? But on the micro scale, we would just be working a ridge line, trying to find our way around like convoluted, impassable sections that would just really slow us down, um, which would cause us to not necessarily have anybody else have to change their plans, but we wouldn't just get to our point for a day, which would cause us to go to sleep earlier, get up earlier, and try and have a longer day the next day in order to make up that time. And we didn't know how long the entire trip was going to take us anyways. So in a way, the whole thing was not a bowl. We were just kind of seeing it as we went. Sure. Um, yeah. And some days were definitely played out a little bit better than others. And which again, to a point we totally expected. So we really just tried to roll with it. In every sense of the word, you were essentially wild at this point, <laughs> right? Cause completely off trail. I, I imagine that you're well outside of most civilized, the most civilizations. Um, did you ever have any sense of danger or, or, uh, uh, not, not being in the condition to continue or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's no way to get around it. Yes. I, I, if my mom's watching, no, no, definitely. We never, <laughs> Everything never was perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah. You guys are on hoverboards the entire time. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think more than anything, it was just the exposed nature of some of the areas. We, we definitely did a lot of like lower fifth class, like low fifth class climbing and scrambling up and down uh, just because it was the most direct route. And we didn't necessarily know we would be encountering that kind of terrain, but we, mm. we felt confident that we could move through it as long as we moved through slowly. Uh, it just got to be more challenging when we get into snow and ice on those types of terrain. And here we are in our like man prees and running shoes and <laughs> running gloves. And you know, when you wished you had better gear. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think it, it would have been a much different experience had, uh, we had done it solo. Like had I just gone alone or had Wolf done it on his own, I think there's a, uh, having a partner and the ability, if you are to get hurt, somebody to know you're hurt and where you are is yeah. a big thing. I think uh, some of the stuff we had done, I'm not sure I would have done alone and felt comfortable doing, but having somebody with you allowed you to ha take um, an intelligent amount of risk or a, an appropriate amount of risk. There's a great question here in the chat room from Jesse Luna. Did you set up specific parameters for your traverse in case someone wanted to do the traverse again or as well? Uh, you know, we did not. I think that uh, if somebody wants to go from Missoula to Banff, they really should. It was one of the most incredible uh, routes or one of the most incredible experiences and adventures in my life. But I would, I would also say that somebody should just choose the route they want to take because there's so many different ways to do it. And I will be the first to say that the way we did it was not the best. Um, it like, there's nothing I would change about it because it was such uh, a valuable experience for me. But I mean, some of the stuff that we got into was like, there was no reason we should have been where we were. Like whether it was on a ridge line, which was like the cool stuff, but also just like heinous, heinous bushwhacking. Oh <laughs> God. You know, where you're like two hours and a quarter mile later, you still like can't touch the ground because you're three Ugh. feet up and all. And you know, it's, about to rain and, I mean, and you're just in these like positions where it's just heinous. And so I think that there's no, I mean, it's my backyard, right? And it's, there's no place I love more and feel more of a connection to than the whole area known as the crown of the continent. But I've, I've been asked that a couple of times now, and I don't necessarily think that the way we did it is the way that I would tell people to do it. I think that if people want to explore that place, they should like get all the maps out, check it out for themselves and see what inspires them and how they want to travel through it. Yeah, there's a good comment here from Pete Chrisock in the chat room. Um, considering it more of an adventure rather than an FKT or an OKT, just because, yeah. you yeah. know, I like you said, you're opening it more towards people choosing their own route because the mountains, it's fairly endless, right? Ridgeline to ridgeline to ridgeline. I'm sure you can see. Oh, you could, yeah, there's endless. a million ways to place it. 
What do you think, uh, you mentioned um, being with Mike and, and how that was really a benefit. What, what do you think the importance of being a duo or in sometimes a, a trio with the photographer and the crew as well, um, how, how was that important in, in this specific adventure? Man, I think it's interesting. I, I definitely uh, ebb and flow on how I like to experience certain things, whether or not I want to share an experience with somebody or whether or not I want to do something alone. And I didn't vacillate at all on this. I really wanted to share it with people who also had an appreciation for the landscape we were moving through. And Mike and I, I mean, we both live here in Western Montana. We love it. We've done a bunch of adventuring around here. And um, for years, we've talked about doing a big run together in either Montana, like from the southern border to the northern border of Montana, or you know what we just did from our front doorsteps. I mean, he literally ran two miles from his house to my house, picked me up, and then we went into the hills. I mean, it was such a, uh, it wouldn't have been the same without him. And Steven, uh, who is an incredible athlete himself, uh, grew up in Western Montana too, and he just has, a deep, deep, deep appreciation for this place. So I think it was dictated a little bit by the goal. I mean, the goal was something that we all shared and therefore it made all the sense in the world to do it together. And um, the crew was great. I mean, we got along great. You know, I, it, there's always disagreements, but we were able to work through them with respect for each other. And uh, there was never this, it was a very healthy thing to have everybody together working together towards this like one goal. and. Uh, to share that with somebody, to me, like made it more valuable. So yeah, no regrets in that regard. Is it something that you are ever going to attempt to top? Um, was was the adventure uh, to the point where it was like a once in a lifetime sort of scenario? Uh, are you coming up with plans for for future adventures that that are on the same scale? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I. I guess when I think about it, I don't think about topping it as much as I just think about like, I feel, felt, I feel like that adventure really built momentum in my mind in what I want to do. I think it was really affirm, reaffirming to know that, A, that's something I love to do. I love that, like that challenge and um, working towards it. And also, honestly, I, I, it was really, really incredible to come back from that and see how interested people were in in that trip and um, as a sponsored athlete uh, I definitely like knowing that uh, I can I can do these crazy adventures and and potentially still get support from brands like the North Face to help um, make something like that happen which they totally invested in this you know in this trip which was great and uh, to to be able to do something that I love doing and that I'm completely inspired by and for it to um, draw attention to a place I love is, is a really good thing. And so uh, I'm really excited to, to do more adventuring. I don't know what the next thing is, um, but it's definitely reaffirming that I'm probably going to do best and be uh, happier, longer, more long-term doing both racing and adventuring um, and not just one or the other. I think they really complement each other well. Great question in the chat room here from Kimasabe and a dovetailed question from Sinclair. What did you pack for this run? How did you pack for this run? And how did you pack uh, for a run that you didn't know the full, uh, they say distance, you knew the full distance, but I was gonna say the full calamity of. <laughs> yeah. So what did you uh, What did you end up packing? Well, I brought two huge duffel bags in the van with like all sorts of contingency gear, like three different sleeping bags of different weights, and different backpacks that were uh, of different sizes for the amount of gear I wanted to carry. Uh, you know, I guess I can probably just touch on a few things. We carried uh, some really lightweight water purification systems, uh, a Sawyer straw and a really lightweight SteriPen. Carried the titanium uh, jet boil stove, which I thought worked really great. Um, we had three guys half most of the time and then just Mike and I uh, a lot of the time in a two-man North Face tent called the O2 tent, and it's incredible, like incredibly lightweight, packs really well. We actually ended up using it because it was lighter weight than it had we each carried a super light bivy on our own. Um, ultralight, uh, or it's called the super light 15 degree and 35 degree sleeping bag from the North Face, also 
crazy lightweight, uh, an ultimate directions pack, which carried really well their uh, 20 liter fast pack. So we never, I never carried more than a 20 liter pack. And the longest we were out was for four days in a row in the Canadian Rockies with snow on the ground. So in a really cold environment, I was still able to carry everything I needed. With that said, I mean, I didn't have much in the way of like, oh shit gear, if things go wrong. Like I definitely didn't have um, that cushion. Like when yeah. at night, right after you ate, you didn't have enough like clothes to stay warm. So you just got in the sleeping bag, but it worked. Was there any instance where you needed climbing gear, ropes, crampons, anything like that? Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> it would have been great. <laughs> 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 and there we and we kept going with our running shoes. Uh, yeah, That's so we, crazy. we yeah, and obviously if it got to the point where we just couldn't do it with the gear we had because we didn't bring it, like we we made the choice early on to leave stuff behind. We had ice axes in the in the van. We never ended up carrying, um, which would have like there was a couple times where I wished we would have had it because we could have taken a much more direct route across the steep snowfield or something like that. Um, but essentially, we made the choice to travel super light, and if we encountered terrain that uh, you know necessitated that gear, we were either going to turn around or try and do it without. And um, we did a little bit of both. Sometimes we were able to meander our way through something uh, and kind of unlock the the this little path through a cliff band, or um, you know, we just like had this classic day where we were literally like stemming between the glacier and the and the cliff um, off of this peak and the. Um, Bomb Marshall Wilderness here in Montana. And anyways, like days that would have been a lot faster had we had the right gear, but we chose not to bring it. So, <laughs> uh, Randy Kafara is asking freeze dried dried food, and I'm curious about that. Yeah, did you bring like the pre made meals? Did you just bring in your own stuff? How'd you do that? Yeah, I'm converted. I never ever. I always like brought tons of cooking gear, backpacking, and like you know, it was like a chef in the backcountry, which is super fun, but it was really heavy. Um, but on this trip, like Mike and Steven both were huge fans of just any sort of mountain house or freeze dried dinners that you could just get. And uh, yeah, sure, they're a little expensive when you have to buy like 80 of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they were life saving and so lightweight and so like just easy and Obviously, you're just craving calories on those days, and I would just—I wouldn't even look at the flavors. We would just all look at the back and see what was like the highest calorie one we could carry that day, and that's how we rolled. And it was great. Um, so yeah, we just picked a bunch of different brands from the store. It, it's always going to be the Mountain House mac and cheese. Mountain House <laughs> mac and cheese, always, always the best. I don't know. Uh, there's a red tie that's really good too. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, hey, yeah, we'll have to get on that. Uh, another great question. People are really curious. They love the term "oh shit" gear. But they want to know what is on your oh shit gear list. Like, what is what is the package that you would have as your oh shit gear? Oh gosh, um, more food. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know. I think I just would have had like a really, uh, oh gosh, what did I like rain pants or a heavier weight rain jacket when the weather gets horrible. Uh, like I just never had enough. I didn't have enough clothes a lot of the time. Like just a big down jacket would have been really nice. Like I had a small, small one that like packed really small, but it just, you know, it'd get below freezing at night and it'd be really cold. And uh, yeah, anything that would just give you warmth, which is food and layers, because um, oftentimes we were lacking those things. So yeah, did you have any sense or or any sort of feeling of uh, sadness uh, once you finished? Because I feel like being out in the country, uh, the back country for that long, you have a connection to it. Did you feel any overwhelming sense of like uh, post run depression or anything like that where you just wanted to get back out? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I was uh, just like really grateful to finish and come home and uh, just kind of reintegrate back into Missoula. And then about a week after, I really crashed, which, you know, it, it wasn't a surprise to me. Like, I think everybody. Uh, no matter what goal you have, if you really work towards it and it's a focus of yours for a long time and you go through that experience, uh, I always call it like post-expedition depression. And after right. a big race or something like that, I mean, you always have that. And, uh, yeah, this was no different. And I was like, I needed to decompress from decompressing and ended up after a week of being home, my girlfriend and I went to uh, Utah for a week for a backpacking trip, which was like life-saving because I needed something to... I needed to actually remove myself 
again from <laughs> society yeah. for a few days and because I just didn't feel like I had time to process it and I was like right back into work and all that kind of stuff and um, being able to back go for a five day backpacking trip was like the best thing and then I came home in a much better state. <laughs> That's great. There, there's a great question here earlier. Uh, I want to make sure that I find it. Um, this is from Chris Hall. What was your most memorable magical running moment? Please describe in detail. And that he might just be referring um, to at, at any time in your previous last couple of years. But I might say, let's say your your most magical memorable moment from the Crown Traverse because it is an incredible feat. Uh oh gosh. I I can't even begin to think about this. I er, I think it was day fourteen. Uh, we were just like two days north of Waterton Glacier National Park, and we were yet still on a ridge line with like beautiful Canadian Rockies to the east and west, or to the west of us specifically. We were on the Continental Divide, so to the east was the plains. But um, and it was like this culmination of fourteen days in a row of being in just awe-inspiring incredible terrain and it was like one day just built on the other and just built on the other and at that point we had crossed we were probably 400 miles into our run and we had crossed two paved roads and the rest of the time we were just out there and so uh i just remember mike and i like taking that moment to be like oh wow this really is happening and that like the train just gets bigger and more just awe-inspiring and there wasn't one specific moment, but it was really like the culmination of a couple of weeks. And the reason I say day 14 is because on day 15, we ended up getting sucked into the valleys and following ATV roads for a few days and getting lost. So it wasn't all wow. that magical and beautiful. We definitely had moments of like depression and being low and getting lost and, you know, all that about all that, which made the other days that much better. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Did you go through those highs and lows associated with like a hundred miler where you're, you know, you're trying to move as fast as you can over a hundred mile distance. In this case, you're maybe moving not as fast uh, as a race, but do you still get those highs and lows? Yeah. a hundred percent. They just happen. They would just last longer. Like we'd have a full couple of days that were just um, really uninspiring or uh, one of us would be experiencing some sort of ache or pain. Uh, you know, just the, the pounding and the day in and day out of the steep terrain with the weight on our backs was like the one thing that really wore us down more. I mean, Mike and I had a couple of nights in a row where both of us just couldn't sleep due to just like knees and hips throbbing. And uh, I don't really take uh, anti-inflammatories unless I have to. And we like, there was a couple of nights where in order to like get some sleep, I did pop a couple of ibuprofen and just to be able to get through the night. But then we would, you know, miraculously turn it around, get some more, like get back to the van, be able to eat real food, you know, and then a lot of it, get those calories back in us, um, have a day that was a little bit more mellower on the docket and really be able to turn it around. I think it was really incredible to learn how to recover while still moving eight hours in a day. Um, and it's all relative, right? I mean, it wasn't full recovery, but the ability to continue on was huge. And uh, we went through waves like that a bunch and just weather. I mean, we had some bad weather along the way, which was to be expected. So we weren't surprised, but yeah, waking up, like hearing it rain all night and waking up to that rain, just turning to snow in the morning and knowing it's just going to stick to every part of you all day long is oh, man. not that exciting. So yeah, we had days like that. Uh, recovery. You, you briefly mentioned that there was a question in here as well from CL, uh, any proper tips for, for good recovery, having done a 23 day adventure plus multiple long, uh, long races and lots of training. Uh, what are the uh, footy tips for recovery? Whew. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I, all the same stuff that you often hear. I mean, I think it's just really important to eat well and get like the right calories back in you and making sure you're, more than anything, just aware of it, aware of what you're eating and when you're eating it. Um, that's something I am perpetually trying to learn more about. Uh, but for me, I think it's like literally, like I'll physically take a break, but if I don't mentally take a break, I sometimes mm -hmm. don't feel if I recover that well. If I'm my best, uh, like looking back, when I'm the most able to recover is when I really let go for a day in the middle of a training cycle or for six weeks after the crown traverse i mean just unplug mentally too like stop watching ginger runner live for a little bit or, <laughs> and like you know running stuff that like makes you feel like you have to go out and run right now and um 
and that kind of stuff. So I, I really just uh, take a step back from my whole running world for mm-hmm. a couple at the end of a season in order to um, kind of refuel both my like just physical body, but also just like my my excitement for running. And I think that's been something I uh, have learned a lot and just in the last couple of years. So. Um, I'm back to rocking, watching Ginger Runner Live now, by the way. <laughs> uh, but honestly, dude, that's something that I was actually going to carry over into my uh, my New Year's goals, my 2016 goals, is is to unplug more because you get so wrapped up in that that fear of missing out, right, that everyone talks about where you see someone post race results or doing some epic, amazing run. And I'm guilty of it where I'll post a picture and I look yeah. at the picture and go, oh, this is going to make people like want to be there and go run and but at the same point, like you just, you really do need to unplug sometimes. So I love that. I think that's probably one of the best tips uh, I've heard on the show. Um, I have to give you huge props, huge congratulations. This, I, I, this is, isn't anything I could ever fathom doing. The Crown Traverse is, is so exponentially larger than anything I've even considered or, or even looked at. 600 miles through brutal backcountry terrain from Missoula to Banff. And Banff, uh, I've seen pictures of Banff. I've always wanted to go to Banff. I've heard it's the SCD capital of Canada, uh, but it looks <laughs> awesome. Like the it's mountains awesome. look incredible. Yeah. And so if that's yeah. any idea of what you were traveling through, you deserve the ultimate <laughs> major props, dude. Huge, huge props for me. <laughs> um, so the, I'm going to try to dovetail here into talking about the rut. Uh, give us a little explanation of what the rut is, how long it's been around, your involvement, and why you are so passionate about it. Yeah, so um, the rut is the brainchild of both my of myself and also Mike Wolf. A handful of years ago, we both, after having some experiences racing in Europe and abroad elsewhere, and feeling this uh, culture of mountain running that was so celebratory and in extremely steep and exposed mountainous terrain really wanted to bring a little taste of that back to the u.s and so uh three and a half years ago uh, we started the rut in big sky montana uh just happened to be the place that we knew was going to work for uh kind of creating a monster of a course that uh would really challenge people would really inspire people be you know uh, the terrain why is a step above a lot of the races in the United States mm-hmm. um, and yeah it's a it's a runner's edge event so I the, the store that I work for I'm a race director for that event through them um, because they're they've been so supportive and helping bring that race to something that could actually be what it is today and so uh, yeah we're c- coming in on four years now and it's uh, been kind of a wild ride with part of we're now developed third year in a row part of the school Die Runner World Series between all of our distances combined, we have about two thousand people in the race, which somebody awesome. is like one of the larger trail events in the country now. Which I didn't even know the numbers. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of ones that large, but just to like four years ago, we never ever ever expected it to be as large as now as it is now. And we have a lot of support to pull it off, but it's uh, yeah, it's great. It's great to have people come to Montana and uh, a lot of people in my community here in Western Montana get really excited to race it. And that makes me feel good as the, uh, as the organizer. So what do you think draws people to the race? Um, I think the, I think a lot of stuff, I think the terrain alone, we did a really good job of, I think showing the more hardcore parts of the course early on when we started to promote this race. And I think it really captured people's attention and, uh, Solomon actually is on board as a sponsor of the event and they've just brought a ton of uh, their best athletes to the event to race and you know having the likes of Killian there uh, I think draws a little bit of attention to the event and uh, you know we, we do yearly uh, videos which have just been really well received showing the the race recap and uh, oh, really yeah. good they're so well done too yeah and having the just having a lot of people champion the race, like the, the race, you know, not only elite athletes, but a lot of people from, when we have people from all over the United States, all over the world coming whom are not elite, but just love, uh, being a part of it. And also we're lucky in that it's right at big sky resort and they have all these great facilities. So it's funny every year that the 50 K goes on, it starts at 6 AM and at 5 45 AM, I'm like, Oh, nobody's here. And then everybody pours out of the like 
thousand hotel rooms within a one minute walk of the start line. And I think that's also just the infrastructure that's there is really great. And I think it lends to uh, just a really good experience throughout the entire weekend. And people are always saying it's really family friendly. And on the other side of the spectrum, people always love the after party. <laughs> and so it's, it's got a little bit of everything. Yeah, seeing pictures and video from the after party uh, it definitely seems to live up to uh, to the hype. It looks a lot of fun. <laughs> we need uh, you there next year. That's the thing. Uh, give us the dates of when the race is, when the registration opens, because I know that's that's going to be on a lot of people's minds. Yeah. So uh, first and foremost, registration opens tomorrow at eight a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, you can go online at runtherut.com to register. Uh, who knows? It could take a month to fill, but it only took a couple of days to fill last year, so it could be even faster this time. So um, if, if people are wanting to register, I would definitely recommend being on their computers at eight. Uh, again, it could take a whole it could take a month, but I don't want to tell people that and it then it can fill in ten minutes and then they miss it. So I think it's um, gonna be a ten minuter, I'll be yeah. honest. <laughs> and <laughs> and then the, the race itself is so we have an eleven K, a VK, a twenty eight K, a fifty K, and a kids run the rut run to run. So you can sign up for any of those. Uh, the race is on Labor Day weekend, uh, which is September 2nd through the 4th this year in Big Sky. Yeah. Do you, uh, this is one of those races that uh, I'm tired of missing. Um, Cascade Crest came right at the, uh, right yeah, like the week before. before. Yeah. And uh, depending on how that unfolds again this year, like, I'm going to the rut no matter what. So Mike, <laughs> you, better, you better be ready to, to see a big redheaded Dude, lumber. Then we would love to have you. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 been now two years. It's like I gotta go. I have to do this thing. Um, I, I'm super excited. I, I want to go to Montana. I have I have been waiting to go there for years. So I'm I'm very very excited about that. Uh, any races for you next year? Like what what is on your calendar as far as I want to race this or maybe another adventure? What's what's next for Footy? Yeah, great question. Um, I should probably think about that. <laughs> um, I am going all in 100% through March for ski mountaineer racing. I'm going to race a half dozen races all over the American West down in uh, Colorado, Utah, um, actually up in Canada a little bit. I'll be doing a big race called the Power Four with Rob Crar, actually. Um, he and I are both like way into it, and we send dorky ski mountaineer race tips back and forth and email all the time and um, are you on the small skis yet he's he's talking oh, about yeah, these yeah. small we're, skis oh, yeah we're on full race kit and just dorking out on it completely and it's fantastic awesome. it's fun to learn and like have such a steep learning curve for sport which don't get me wrong trail running i have a steep learning curve but uh for this is so it feels so new and novel so i'm doing that and then uh racing wise i don't have anything figured out for the year uh, by by all means I'm gonna have a full race season I'm excited probably to get back to Europe I didn't go last year and uh, I just really love racing over there I love the competition and the courses that are up there so um, I'd love to do UTMB again it's the I've done it four times and it's a week before the rut and I just don't see how I'll ever be able to pull it off for it so um, yeah I got a lot on my mind but nothing nothing uh, nailed down just yet uh, regardless, but we can't we can't wait to follow you next year. I mean, if if the crown traverses any any impetus as to what could be in your future of things that you do and projects oh, yeah. that you undertake, yeah. man, it's going to be awesome. And uh, will there be any sort of uh, video or, or or photo gallery that will be coming as a result of the crown traverse? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, I do think there will be a video. Yeah, we had a couple friends following along and. Uh, uh, I think the North Face did pick it up and we'll be doing, Mike and I will probably be doing a speaker series, which is something that the North Face does with their athletes and some expeditions. So we'll be traveling around a bit to some cities, uh, speaking about the trip, which will be really fun. And uh, also I'm sure that video, which will be like a 15 minute, I'm guessing right around there cut, I'm sure will be released online. And so that should be around like next April or so. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Cannot wait. Uh, we're going to kind of wrap up the main show here uh, with Mike. For those of you who are watching live, if I did not get to your questions, I apologize. We'll get to them in the post show. We'll do a quick post show with footy and, and make sure that we get some of those questions through because there are some very specific ones that I know uh, we'll want to get answered as well. But before we move into the post show footy, uh, I have a, a thing here I do with all new guests on the show. It's called the quickie question quiz where I just rapid fire questions at you. You come up with the quickest answers you possibly can. Uh, you let me know when you're ready. They're very easy questions, but you let me know when you're ready and I'll just start going. 
Let's do this. What was your first race? Uh, it was a 5K in Jefferson, Ohio, where I got lost and won the race uh, at the local fairgrounds. <laughs> you got lost everybody and got, still won. Everybody got lost and I happened to get lost and then get found again first. So, <laughs> Did you get lost by like cutting the course uh, 2.5 mi miles shorter? Uh, it ended up being short and I didn't get, I got sent, we all got sent the wrong way by a wayward volunteer. Got it. You were <laughs> not the only one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what is your favorite running movie? Uh, man, the long green line, which is about a cross country team in York, Illinois, the York high school cross country team. Got to watch it. It's badass. Um, inspiring documentary. Very, very good. Uh, trails or road? Uh, trails. Favorite place to run currently? Uh, I really love running in uh, the Rattlesnake Valley, which is where I live in Missoula. There's just a bunch of trails to the north here that I run year-round and have been for a decade. Someone in the chat room actually mentioned the, that you live near the Rattlesnake, and it's like perfect access to trails. It is, yep. What is a bucket list race? Uh, the, oh gosh, good question. Um, the Diagonal de Fou, uh, 100 miler, uh, it's part of the Ultra Trail World Tour. It looks steep and gnarly and I'd love to do it. Jungle, right? That's the jungle one? That's the hard part. I don't like the heat, but I think it would be a good challenge. <laughs> Guilty pleasure TV show. Oh man, I am hooked on The Wire right now. I'm not sure if you've ever watched it. Incredible, uh, yeah. Incredible writing, incredible plot development. I'm like so hooked. Such Thanks. such a good show. Very good <laughs> choice. Uh, do you prefer Up High, Sea Forever, or Deep Forest, Sound of Water? Oh, Sea Forever, every time. Favorite pre-race meal? Uh, ooh, anything that's like really simple. Sweet potatoes, salad, chicken, pasta. I But like nothing too processed or crazy or spicy. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite post-race indulgence? Uh, ice cream and beer. Good choice. <laughs> uh, and your current running kicks? Uh, you know, we've got a couple uh, shoes that we're working on at the North Face. There's the shoe that Dylan ran in at TNF 50, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, the Ultra Cardiac, but also, if I'm being honest, right now it's all winter here, so we have these uh, Ultra MTs with a Gator integrated into them which is great just because it's super snowy here and I just need a ton of grip just to slide around on the trails. So, nice. uh, and also a pair of Dina fit ski boots. Cause I've been running in those some too. <laughs> uh, that's the part of the schema that I don't understand. So you guys aren't wearing actual running gear at all. They're ski no, boots, all but stuff. are they flexible? Yeah. It's so lightweight and the articulation is crazy. And like, you can, you can run in them. I mean, not like they're a running shoe, but you can, you can physically run in them, which is crazy to me because that's not how ski boots are. Um, yeah, that, I only remember the ski boots I grew up wearing, you know, going downhill skiing or whatever, which are completely uh, immobile. Like, you feel like a klutz in them. Yeah, yeah, you That's do. Crazy. <laughs> uh, well, Mike, I really appreciate you being on the show. Um, we'll have to get you and Wolf on the show at some point uh, to, to recap all the cool adventures that you guys have going on up there in Montana. Um, another shout out uh, to where people can find you on social media and perhaps another shout out for the rut. Go for it. Oh, sure. Um, I think Mike Foot MT will get you most places on social media for me, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and then runtherut.com is where you'll find all information about the rut. And if you're interested in signing up, 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time tomorrow. Do it. Go. I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be a 10 minute. Uh, I'm going to have to follow you on Twitter and see, like, Basically, okay. how soon after eight a.m. it's going to be uh, just it's sold out? Sorry, yeah. guys. I'll, I'll be I'll be glued to the computer, making sure there's no fires to put out, but also just seeing yeah, yeah how it goes. So thanks for having me on, Ethan. Of course, man. I'm sorry it took 99 episodes, but you are the first <laughs> of 2016, uh, and I'm honored to have you on the show, man. And it's always really great to see you in person at races too. So I can't wait for that. Are you going back to Squamish this year? You're gonna go back there. Or you uh, you know, I love that race. It's definitely in the cards. I, I think there's a million races in the cards right now. I just need to figure yeah. it out. So, yeah. 
Uh, well, awesome. It was great to have you on the show. Stick around. We're going to do a quick post show with, with Footy. Uh, so those of you who didn't get questions answered, ask them now. Kim is pulling the questions and, and getting to me so we can kind of rapid fire through them. Uh, reminder, next week is the 100th episode. So those of you uh, who are still watching live or maybe who are watching the archive version, you guys are the hardcore Ginger Runner Live fans. I know you are. Um, your favorite moments. If you want to email me your favorite moments, I'm going to send out kind of a, a description of what I'm looking for as far as... Um, uh, email, subject line, and stuff like that, so I can at least uh, get them all situated into a folder, because otherwise it's going to be a mass uh, shitstorm of, of emails to random inboxes. So uh, keep an eye on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I will be looking for the best moments, your favorite moments from the last 100, or I guess last 99 episodes, and tonight's episode is included in that too. Uh, so think back. If you go back and watch an archive version or listen to an archive version and, and let me know what you guys think are going to be uh, your favorite moments, I'll put out a description of how to submit those so I can make sure uh, I get to see all of them. Uh, next week is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm trying to do some new things next week. Uh, so very excited about that. And I have to say thank you to everybody for supporting this show from day one, uh, the pilot, episode zero. Technically tonight, technically tonight is the 100th <laughs> episode. Woody. <laughs> You yes. win. You win. <laughs> I think the way the math works is this is technically the hundredth episode because the pilot I just considered. That's it. I'm claiming the hundredth episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's yours. Wolf missed out. This is yours. I love um, it. Uh, but yeah, so so next week I, I'm just I'm so thankful to all of your continued views, support, uh, continuing to come back every single Monday at six p.m. Um, we'll be doing it for as long as uh, it's still fun. Uh, so I will be doing it as long as it's fun, which is probably going to be forever because it really is fun to meet all you guys. And especially like people like Footy are, are pretty damn amazing. Uh, so that's it. Let's uh, we'll wrap up the show, move into the post show very quickly. But uh, again, thank you, everyone, for the continued support. If you would like to uh, contribute to the channel to help make sure that things continue to go, uh, go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. You can support at every level and you can cancel at any time. It's just like Kickstarter, but ongoing. And it's been uh, really rewarding. It's been incredible to be able to uh, to continue to make the films and and do all the reviews and all those things for free for you guys to view. Uh, thank you and courtesy to all of the Patreon supporters and follow across social networks. You know how to find it. Just search the Ginger Runner. All that good stuff. Uh, stick around. Let's do the post show with Mr. Footy. <laughs> Keep pressing the wrong button tonight. A lot of that going on. Uh, pulling up the opening credits and stuff like that. There's already some good stuff going on in the chat room as far as their favorite moments, including uh, seeing Max King's shoe collection. Footy, I don't know if you've ever been to Max King's house before. He has a wall of shoes. It's, it's pretty literally, legendary. I've never seen it, but I've heard of it. <laughs> it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy. Um, all right. So here was a great question from Chris Chris Hall earlier. And we even had uh, Jason Coop jump in the chat room, which I think was pretty cool. Coop, oh, if you're still cool. watching, what's up, man? Uh, but the question from Chris was, do you utilize a coach? If so, whom? How long have you been working with this person if you are working with a coach? And what about this coach if you are working with a coach? Drew you to work with him or her? <laughs> um, I do, yeah. You know, I probably should have mentioned Coop earlier. Uh, so I work with Jason Coop of Carmichael Training System. Uh, he is... Uh, a, a great human being, which really drew me to him. Uh, he's coached, just been, he's been on this show. Uh, I I think I first got to know him through Dakota Jones, who uh, has been coached by Jason for years now. And he, it just turned out that many of the people whom I respect and are incredible athletes and kick my ass in races were coached by Jason. So I figured something was going right there. And um, I've been working with him since uh, February of last year. So we're coming up on a year right now and it's been great. I mean, he, more than anything, I just need to be held accountable and also just be saved for myself at times. Mm -hmm. Um, just like anybody else, I can overdo it. And, uh, there's no lack of hard work in working with Jason, but I think it's just more focused and there's a lot more intensity and, uh, you know, he, he just, there's a lot more structure to my training now because of him, including, just lots of interval sessions, which really work me aerobically and allow me to um, progress as far as my ability to really push for a, a long distance for like at a high, high intensity for a long time. So yeah, it's been great. Yeah, you're not the uh, the only athlete to have on the show that that's just really saying his praises. And um, it, you're obviously 
dominating some of these incredibly difficult races. So you're, you're doing something right with your training, dude. You're absolutely okay. crushing it. Uh, we had a question here from Lawton Hare. Top three go-to trails in Missoula and why? Oh, great. I can answer those quick. Uh, in the winter right now, Pengelly Ridge, southern side of Mount Sentinel, which is right outside of the university, uh, gets the most sun and the snow melts the quickest in the winter. For And it's really steep and you can get 2,000 feet in a couple miles and just kicks your ass. Uh, I love anything. Sawmill, Gulch, the Curry Gulch and the Rattlesnake is just a fantastic place, really quiet and peaceful. Um, also, you can just have really fun runs in the North Hills. Uh, right off of Duncan Drive, uh, this time of year specifically, because it gets a ton of sun and the trails get a lot of traffic, so they're nice and packed and grippy. Uh, Jason Coop in the chat room says, Mike is a great human being as well. <laughs> mutual, uh, mutual love. The love goes both ways. Coop, we need to catch up. <laughs> and uh, Akimo Sabe also says that Coop has the best headsets. I agree, Coop had the best set of headphones on the show, bar none. I should do awards next week, Kim. I should do awards of like best yes. blank. Uh, Jason Coop would win best headset, that's for sure. Um, I that. And uh, best uh, best close up would go to you, my friend. Oh, Everyone, yeah, because people were at the very beginning of the show. People were saying it was uh, it was becoming a footy face. You could see the footy oh, face. No. Oh no! Oh <laughs> no! <laughs> Kimo Sabe is asking, does it help to have facial hair to be a trail runner, footy? Uh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go against the grain here and say no. I don't have a reason. Aerodynamics, right? Because it actually it would hurt to have facial hair for aerodynamic purposes. Let's see. There's a question from Mark Dolden. Mike, do you get – we kind of answered a little bit of this, but I'm, I'm curious about just kind of how much you end up utilizing your time uh, doing this. But do you get much time or chances to snowboard or ski in Montana? Also, have you tried running in snowshoes? I have done all those things. Uh, I haven't snowboarded in a long time, but I ski. I mean, I ski, I'm skiing six days a week right now, so um, I am skiing a ton. Uh, I just get out in the morning. We have a couple ski areas close to town that you can hike up in the morning before the lifts open and ski down. And so I've been getting up really early and getting in a few hours of training uh, in the mornings, and it's it's been fantastic. I I haven't I have snowshoed running, and you know, more power to anybody who does it, but. I just m love being on skis when I have the option. So that's where I go. Can you, uh, I'm always really curious about this with the schemo side of things. Are you able to explain kind of the, what a schemo race is? Cause I see pictures, I see videos, but I still don't quite fully comprehend what you guys have to go through. Whew. Yeah. So ski mountaineer racing is a sport that's very, uh, established in Europe and it uh, has a governing body. It's trying to make it into the Olympics in 2022. Um, in the United States, it's just just gaining traction. And essentially, it's using the technique and form that you would to go backcountry skiing. But most of the time, you do it on area at a ski resort on a, on a course that's delineated on that day that involves making you uh, skin uphill, skin up steep hills, boot pack uphill, ski down. Um, really steep, gnarly terrain. They try and do it in really technical terrain because it's about um, really utilizing all the different skill sets to move efficiently in the mountains in the winter. And so it's really focused on lightweight gear, uh, you know, really high intensity. It, it, you, the races usually only take a couple hours, which is short compared to what I'm used to and a much higher intensity. Uh, and it's honestly, you, you run, if you're serious about it and you don't care about how you look, which I don't at all is you wear a one piece spandex suit because it's much faster <laughs> and uh, functional. And uh, it's, it, you really focus on transitions and making it a uh, very fast transitioning from skiing to um, downhill to uphill and boot packing and all that. And it's, it's cool. The people who get into it, get really into it. It's slightly cost prohibitive. Uh, it's really expensive gear. And I definitely am really well aware of that right now, <laughs> but uh, it's worth it because living in, a place where there's skiing in the winter, it's just a natural way to move in the mountains and it makes all the sense in the world. So you brought up a, a, a good point. So ski resorts will, will delineate a course on that given day and people will, can just like do essentially like loops. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's just like a, a race course for trail running. I mean, you follow flags the whole time and it's just one big loop. Um, so when you, or a point to point depending on the race. And so, 
you're you're literally going to you're just following flags the entire time when you get to the top of one hill you transition and ski down another way and then you get to the bottom you transition you ski up another way and so you're kind of all over the place and uh yeah, I mean, just depending on each resort, it's a different type of course. But if they have, say, a big couloir that people normally ski down, oftentimes you're boot packing up the thing, like with the skis on your back. And they just really try and make it really complex and challenging, which is fun. So, yeah. And it's up to you of, uh, between like when you switch from skis to boots? Uh, no. Will the terrain no, dictate that? It's like being in a triathlon in that like there's a transition zone. Like there's a a, spe a person a volunteer there like watching you okay now is when you have to switch out to put the skis on your pack and that kind of thing and and you where all those transition zones is where you would do it anyways because it's where it makes the most sense to but yeah they literally watch people do it uh theodore kt in the chat room is saying next up spandex suits and trail running that i'm into um, it <laughs> Whatever we all wear, we all wear like man. I mean, at least on the bottom half, I'm all about spandex. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a huge. Man I, someone's gonna. Do, I mean, you already see. I think like the tri suit style. I feel, man. I feel like I've seen like pictures from the '80s. You know, the early ultra yeah. days when 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 guys and girls would do that, where they would wear like the one piece, uh, yeah. like the unitard, like the the yeah. spandex one. I, I think that, that already exists. I don't, I, don't, I don't judge. I mean, I probably not gonna be wearing spandex on the top half trail running anytime soon, but. You never know. <laughs> do you do any flat land or treadmill tempo runs? Asks Nick Arndt. Like any runs at five something pace per mile to uh, even trails for ultras. Does tempo runs help your ultra training? Yeah, so it's kind of a two part answer. So I do a ton of tempo effort training. Uh, and historically up until last year, I definitely did some flat stuff. All of 2015, I never ran a hard flat run in the entire year. So working with Jason Coop, we do, I mean, I'll do three or four tempo efforts a week in my hardest training, but it will be uphill all the time. So I'll be working at 85% right. capacity aerobically, but it'll be uphill. So um, I, I probably, maybe I've lost speed, but, and sometimes I worry about that, but then when it comes down to it, none of my races or my objectives ne really need speed as much as they need aerobic endurance and strength. And so I'm definitely gaining those in the training I'm doing and I'm staying uninjured and doing it because I have lots of, I've historically had a lot of lower leg issues and whenever I get on a track or a really fit flat trail and I'm just hammering hard at five minute pace or low five minute pace, uh, I, I get tendonitis in my foot or something's going on. And so it, when I'm doing my hardest efforts uphill, uh, it's just been a lot easier on my body, which has been great. Uh, a great question from Kimo Sabe, and we'll let this kind of be the last one. Are you on Strava? Can people follow you on Strava to see sort of uh, kind of what you're doing? I am not, and I probably won't be anytime soon. I was on, <laughs> Strava, I was on Strava once, and, and I'm actually all about it. I just... I guess I just choose my platforms and I can't do it all or I choose not to do it all. But I was on Strava for like two days and I did one workout up a mountain here in Missoula and I got a uh, king of the mountain and it emailed somebody and told him I kicked his butt. And like my e friend emailed me and he's like, Oh, I see you had a good workout today. And I like had previously like set all the privacy settings on Strava because I didn't want anybody to know what I was doing. And turns out that's not what Strava's for. So I got off of it immediately because I didn't want anybody to know. That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about it on the show before. We often call it getting crard because Rob doesn't upload often. Yeah. He'll like, he'll take a whole year and, and collect all of his activities and then he'll yeah. upload them all at once. And then everybody in, in Ultra and Trail will be like, Dude, I got like six emails from Rob Carr saying that he beat X time on some random right. mountain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, totally, I totally get it. And, and it's, a, it's another thing that we're talking about, kind of unplugging and, and separating a little bit from uh, just seeing everyone's running and, and all that kind of thing. And I totally, totally get it. Saying yeah. unplugged can sometimes and be not, And I'm not a hater at all. Like, I'm all about all that stuff. But I just, I guess I just choose it. Like, I just need, I have a certain saturation point. So... It, it ebbs and it flows. Sometimes I'm way into it. Sometimes I need to back off for a bit. So I think everybody sure. has a relationship with it. Uh, well, dude, I really appreciate you taking the time tonight. Sit down with us, have a beer, and, and uh, talk running and, and race directing and uh, the crown traverse. I really appreciate you for jumping on here at footy. Uh, any last words for those who are watching live? 
Run the rut. <laughs> <laughs> Run the rut. 8 a.m. tomorrow. Registration <laughs> opens. Go. Check it out. Uh, you're not going to want to miss it because it's going to kick your ass, and that's a good thing. Uh, thank you all again for tuning in live. We'll see you guys next week for episode 100. 101. <laughs> Woody, Woody gets 100. Uh, but the real uh, 100th episode will be next Monday. You guys will not want to miss it. Kim and I are heading back to Los Angeles tomorrow morning, very bright and early. Big thank you to Justin and Destiny for letting us use their house for the last three weeks for live shows. And uh, thank you all again for tuning in live. That is it for tonight's broadcast. We'll see you guys next week for Ginger Runner Live 100. Night!